one. You'll hear a head teacher and a teacher discussing a school camping trip. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Can I speak to you for a moment? Of course, Jamie. Come in. Have a seat. I've just finished looking through the reports for this term. It looks like the pupils are doing very well. Yes, I think they are. It's all going fine. So, Jamie, what's on your mind? Well, I've been thinking about next month's camping trip, the one for year ten. Yes, we've got it scheduled for the twenty-third to the twenty-sixth, if I'm not mistaken. Ah,、uh, actually, I think it's the twenty-fourth to the twenty-seventh. Let's just check. Oh, right. Yes, yes, you're right. So, well. I've been thinking about how we might possibly make this year's event even better than last year's. Not that last year's wasn't great, but suggestions for improvement are always welcome, Jamie. So, what have you been thinking about? Well, to tell the truth, I wasn't completely happy with the camp we used last year. It was rather small, and I didn't feel that the grounds were particularly well kept. Go on. I did some searching. And I think I found the perfect spot. It's called Shepton Meadows, and is that the campsite in the Lake District? No, actually, it's just outside Carlisle. It's a huge site, and it's on a lovely lake, Lake Brant, I believe it's called. Half the site is forested, and the rest, the actual camping area, is grassy. For kids that rarely get to see anything more than concrete, it's ideal. And the facilities are amazing. There's a basketball court, a large pool, and a football pitch. There are well-marked trails through the forest for hiking, and the lake is there for swimming and other water sports. I believe there's even a lifeguard service. That sounds like it might suit our purposes perfectly. Did you happen to find out about availability and cost? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. I called them yesterday evening, and there are plenty of spots available. And because we're a non-profit organisation, they said they would give me a reduction in the price. If I remember correctly, we paid five pounds a head last year. Yes, per night, right? Yes, each child paid ten pounds for the two nights. Well, at this campsite, it's only four pounds per night, and they told me that if we had over fifty children, which we do, they could give us a further ten percent off. That's very reasonable, isn't it? Well, from what you've told me, I think we should probably go ahead and book. Excellent. I'm sure the children will love it. I'm sure they will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now, Jamie, have you given any thought to an itinerary by any chance? As a matter of fact, I have. Wait one second. Yes, here it is. I've made a few notes. Okay. So now these are just ideas, of course. Yes, yes. Go on. Let's hear what you've got. Right. We time it so that we arrive at the camp around seven on Friday evening. It'll still be light then, and we'll have plenty of time to set up camp and get ourselves settled in. At eight, we could have a barbecue, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs, something that's nice and easy to prepare, and that children love. Yes. Then lights out would be at nine thirty, so the children will get a good night's sleep and be up bright and early at seven on Saturday morning. Breakfast would be at seven thirty, an hour's hiking from eight till nine, and then a couple of hours at the lake. 
that would take us up to eleven. I think that an hour of free time would then be in order. Let them have a chance to explore a bit on their own, you know? Yes, great idea. And then? Let's see, a picnic lunch at twelve, and then sports in the afternoon till four. Another swim until five, and then supper. After clean-up, around 6.30, we could have a talk-back session, where the children get a chance to discuss their day and anything else they might have on their minds. Then a campfire and sing-along at 8, back to the tents at 9.30, and, well, that takes care of Saturday. Excellent. Excellent. That would certainly keep them busy. What about Sunday? Sunday, right. As on Saturday, same wake-up and breakfast times, and then I thought we could go on a bit of a day trip. There are some caves about an hour's walk from the camp, which I thought the children might find interesting. We could leave at eight, which would mean we'd get to the caves at nine. They could explore for a couple of hours, and we'd head back at eleven. Twelve o'clock would see us back at the meadows. An hour's swim, and then lunch at one. Then we could have organized games in the afternoon until supper at five. It would take us an hour to clean up our sights and pack up. We'd be on the buses at six and all set to head back into the city. Well now, you've certainly put a lot of thought into this, Jamie, and it's paid off. I think it sounds wonderful. I can't think of a thing that needs to be changed. Let's go for it. Brilliant. I'll get the itinerary printed up and put it up on the notice board this afternoon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an introductory speech to students at a summer school. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 14. Good morning everyone, and welcome to Climb Summer School. Now, I know most of you have travelled a long way to get here, and you're probably looking forward to settling into your rooms, so I promise I won't keep you long, but we've got to get through this very brief induction just to make your stay here as pleasurable as possible. Now, as you can see, while we're located very close to the centre of London, we're actually quite cut off from the main road and we've got plenty of space for our facilities and students. This was part of our founder's vision, Jasmine Klein, who thought that the best environment for teenage students would be a place that combines the comforts of a big cosmopolitan city with the beauty and serenity of a quiet, remote site. Now, back in 1983, when our school was founded, this all here was an abandoned warehouse, and the classes were held in the main building that you can see over there. There were no trees, no conifers surrounding the property. There wasn't even a main gate. It took years and a great deal of effort to get our school to where it is today. And I'm sure that if you take a look at page 34 in your brochures, where you can find a picture of what the school used to look like back then, you'll agree that the changes we've made are more than impressive. But it's not just the facilities that make Climb Summer School special, obviously, and I'm certain you already know this. Over the following ten weeks, you'll receive an assortment of classes on a variety of topics, ranging from language, literature and poetry to creative writing, communication and project management. 
All of these modules have been designed to improve your chances of getting a place in the universities of your choice, while also giving you the opportunity to learn, excel and, of course, also socialise with people from all over the world. I can tell you, just among the 30 of you, we've got about 21 different nationalities. So what happens now? First of all, I'll be handing out a map of the premises for you to have a look at and explaining where everything is. Once we're done here, you'll all be taken to your rooms where you can unpack and relax for a couple of hours. And later on, we'll be having our first activity of the day, a mix and match lunch in the main hall, where you'll have the chance to meet your new classmates. Later on in the afternoon, we'll be handing out your first project assignments and splitting you into teams. And tonight we'll be having our very first film night, starting with an early 20th century special. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 15 to 20. So, let's get on with the map. You've already got a version of it in your brochures, so if you can open them to the last page so we can have a look. Very well. As I showed you before, the actual school is right over there in the middle. That's where you'll be having most of your classes. Adjacent to it, you'll find the main hall, which is where we'll be hosting most events, such as today's lunch. On the left from the main building, you'll find a smaller building which is where the accommodation and welfare offices are located. This is labelled as the garden office at the front, and it's easy to spot because it has a green door. Each of you is assigned to a different residence hall. We've got three residence halls in total, one on the left and two on the right. The one right next to the garden office is Ursula Hall, named after our founder's sister, while the other two are Peter Hall and William Hall. Now... As you can see, there are three more buildings to the left of the semicircle here, and one more building on the right-hand side, next to William Hall. So that one, which is shaped a bit like a dome, is the pavilion. This is where all your letters will be delivered, and in the basement floor you'll also find a laundrette. Please make sure you've got plenty of one-pound coins, as you'll need one for the washing machine and another for the dryer. And that row of buildings on the left... The one closest to us here at the gate is the canteen, where you'll be able to buy snacks as well as breakfast, lunch and dinner on days when we don't have an event with food provided. The next one is the gym, which is open from 7am to 8pm from Monday to Friday and until 10pm at the weekend. And the last building, right over there, is the study centre, where you'll find plenty of computers and books, as well as a great selection of DVDs and magazines that you can borrow with only a small refundable deposit of £5. Now, please remember to keep your student card with you at all times, as you'll need it to access most of these facilities. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a tutor and two students, Amanda and Jake. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty one to twenty five. So, Jake and Amanda, how did the project go? Very well, I think, Doctor Hinton. I certainly learned a lot and enjoyed myself at the same time. Me too. So, remind me, what was your project about? Basically, what makes successful people, let's call them top achievers, successful? Yes. How are they different from us? What do they do that other less successful people don't do? Interesting. And did you come to any conclusions? Quite a few, actually. Good. Share some with me then. Well, I'd always thought that a top achiever would be the sort of person who would bring work home every night and slave over it, but it appears not. Those types tend to peak early and then go into decline. They become addicted to work itself, with much less concern for results. We found that high achievers were certainly ready to work hard, but within strict limits. They knew how to relax, could leave their work at the office, prized close friends and family life, and spent a healthy amount of time with their children and friends. There's a lesson for us all there. Anyway, go on. It's also very important to choose a career which you enjoy, not just one that pays well or which assures you of a pension many years down the line. Surely that's important, though, Amanda. Yes, I agree. But being happy in your work is far more important than anything else. Top achievers spend over two thirds of their working hours on doing work they truly prefer. And only one third on disliked chores. They want internal satisfaction, not just external rewards such as pay rises and promotions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Actually, in the end, they often have both, because they enjoy what they are doing, so their work is better and their rewards higher. Yes, Jake, that certainly makes sense. Now, can I ask you something? Do high achievers, as you call them, take many risks? Yes and no. I interviewed one business executive, who told me he was able to take risks because he carefully considered how he could salvage the situation if it all went wrong. He imagined the worst that could happen, and if he could live with that, he went ahead. If not, he didn't take the chance. Other people prefer to stay in what I heard described as the comfort zone setting for security, even if it means settling for mediocrity and boredom too. Would you call top achievers perfectionists? Contrary to what I expected, no, I wouldn't. We came to the conclusion that a lot of ambitious and hardworking people are so obsessed with perfection that they actually turn out very little work. I happen to know a university teacher, a friend of my mother's, who has spent over ten years preparing a study about a playwright. She is so worried that she has missed something; she still hasn't sent the manuscript to a publisher. Meanwhile, the playwright, who was at the height of his fame when the project began, has faded from public view. The woman's study, even if finally published, will interest few people. So, what has this got to do with top achievers? Well. Top achievers are almost always free of the compulsion to be perfect. They don't think of their mistakes as failures. Instead, they learn from them, so they can do better next time. Hmm. Well, would you call them competitive? High performers focus more on bettering their own previous efforts than on beating competitors. In fact, I, or we. 
came to the conclusion that worrying too much about competitors' abilities and possible superiority can be self-defeating. Yes, and we found that top achievers tend to be team players rather than loners. They recognise that groups can solve certain complicated problems better than individuals, and are eager to let other people do part of the work. Yes, loners who are often over concerned about rivals can't delegate important work or decision making. Their performance is limited because they must do everything themselves. Well, it looks as if you two have done a thorough job. And learn something into the bargain too. Now there are just a couple of points I'd like to clarify with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about English language. You have thirty seconds to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-seven. Those of you who were here last week will remember that we talked about the journey of the English language from its early Indo-European origins through to Old English, Middle English, and then to Early and Late Modern English before it reached the form that it has today. Today, we will be continuing that theme by focusing on the future of the English language and all the places it might go from here. There are about 2.1 billion people around the world who can speak English. Out of these. Only 400 million are native speakers, which means that four in five English speakers are non-natives. This is obviously quite an impressive number, considering that just two centuries ago, in 1801, there were only about 20 million speakers of English around the world, and languages like French and German were ahead of English in terms of how many people were using them. But what does it mean? What it means is that the future of the English language doesn't really depend on its native speakers, but on that massive number of non-native speakers learning it around the world. Has everyone has anyone heard the term pidgin before or creole? A pidgin is a simplified version of a language which acts as a bridge between two people who don't have a common language, allowing them to communicate with each other. While a creole is a language that evolves from a pidgin, with the difference that it is fully formed with clear grammatical rules and vocabulary, there are currently dozens of pidgin and creole languages based on English around the world. For example, Nigerian pidgin or Jamaican patois. These languages are also known as Englishes. What's interesting about these Englishes is how different they sound to, for lack of a better term, proper English. Take the word trousers, for instance. In Sheng, which is a Kenyan Creole language, they're called longi because they're long. But even versions of English that are recognized as official variations or dialects still differ greatly from each other. Americans and Jamaicans would call the back of a car where you store your luggage the trunk. Britons, Australians, Canadians, and other Commonwealth countries would call it the boot. A subway in the UK is a tunnel under a road that allows pedestrians to cross safely. In the US, it's an underground train. You might think of these differences as minute, but when you take into account the dozens of different versions of English out there, a very intriguing parallel arises with another language from the past.
Latin. Latin, too, used to be a lingua franca. Nowadays, it's all but dead, spoken only by a few clerics and scholars. At some point in history, it splintered into various different languages, which became known as Romance languages. For example, Spanish, Italian, or French. There are some that theorize that the same thing might happen to English in the near or distant future, that all these Englishes we have today in different countries will continue to develop, so pigeons will turn into Creole languages, and Creole languages will turn into just languages, and English itself, as we know it today, will disappear, or become less and less important. It's an interesting theory, if nothing else. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 38 to 40. It makes sense that, as English grows in popularity, countries, especially those with a strong sense of identity and tradition, will develop their own versions of the language, marked by the idiosyncrasies of their culture. Just think of the contribution of dialects such as Jamaican or South African English. In the past 50 years alone, they've added about 25,000 words to the English language. Most of these related to a local context, that wouldn't have existed in English before the spread of colonialism. In terms of numbers, just those are enough for a brand new language. There are some flaws to this theory too, however. While it's true that Latin and English have a lot of similarities in terms of how they developed or have developed throughout history, there is one big difference. We currently live in an era of globalization. Today, you can be in India and stream an American film or TV series in seconds. You can be in Nigeria and listen to British music. You can be in Brazil and read a novel from an Australian author. Just a few centuries ago, this was unthinkable. So what's the other way that English could go? According to some experts, there's the possibility that it could maintain its status as the world's global language, but with a few differences. Already today, most conversations in English occur between non-native speakers. While many of these might be fluent, the majority probably only have an intermediate understanding of the language, devoid of the nuances, colloquialisms, and complex collocations that native speakers employ in their interactions. This means that over time, English could turn into some sort of world-speak, the official lingua franca for the entire world, but in a simplified form. Some scholars have even started trying to develop that version of English by selecting the most useful words in the English vocabulary for non-native speakers to learn. Robert McCrum has compiled a comprehensive list of 1,500 words, for example, a version of English that he calls globish. And what about traditional native speaker English? It might continue to exist, but lose its popularity, as the previous theory suggests. There are many more theories about the future of the English language, of course. I've only focused on the two main ones, because they clearly demonstrate our uncertainty when it comes to how this beautiful language will develop. English is in a unique, unprecedented position. No other language has achieved the same levels of popularity in human history, especially in terms of non-native speakers. So, as this is clearly uncharted territory, only time will be able to tell us what will happen. That is the end of part four.